Good morning. It is Wednesday morning and time for devotions. As you may note, uh, my hair is a little shorter. Kathy cut my hair yesterday and uh, I am very thankful for that. And you may be too. Anyway, it's, uh, it is uh, a, another day as we look at the church for others in our theme here. And it is uh, kind of grand dismal out there right now, hot and humid. Uh, but the love of God is always cooling when it's hot and warming when it's not. So uh, we, are, we are in good shape together. Let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Lord Jesus Christ, pour out your Spirit upon your church so that she may faithfully and constantly serve you and your children. In the name of Christ, amen. Today's reading is from... <clears throat> Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 13. Romans 15, 1 through 13. And again, a quick reminder, Paul was writing to the Christians in Rome whom he did not know, had never met. He did not start that church. Uh, he had heard about them, and, uh, and he was writing to really make sure that their theology was uh, on target. Because there were so many people who were trying to hijack the church early on. I, I don't know that that has changed throughout history, really. But um, there was a, a whole lot of different groups that were coming in that were trying to hijack the church and turn it into a reflection of their understanding, uh, which was often a direct contradiction of, uh, of what Christ had taught. And... Um, and in a, in a world where philosophy was really uh, one of the key forms of entertainment and, uh, and also uh, a world that worshipped the human mind uh, to a large degree, and that was sort of the nature of philosophy uh, in those days and still today, um, in point of fact. Uh, we have minds and we better use them. But uh, there is also that element in which we relinquish some of that uh, to God um, and all of ourselves to God, ultimately, if we want to be in Christ. So Paul is, is, is writing them to ensure that they have a solid understanding of who Jesus was, who Jesus is, who Jesus will be, and how their relationship with God needed to be structured if, in fact, they were going to be in a relationship with God. And, uh, and so that still applies to us today, uh, very clearly and, uh, and very surely. So uh, we need to uh, work hard to continue to grow in our relationship with God and commit more and more and more of who and what we are to the Lord. And then, as we, uh, as we do that, we are progressively more and more able to offer our um, service into the world around us as representatives of Jesus Christ. This is not an either or, never has been, never will be. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a following of Christ for the purpose that Christ might live through us in the world. So let's read uh, Romans 15 verses 1 through 13. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to edify him. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached thee fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. 
as it is written, Therefore I will praise thee among the Gentiles, and sing to thy name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And further, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, he who raises, who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So the passage talks about hope, it talks about glorifying God, and it talks. Uh, uh, it begins with a, uh, a little bit of advice, and then it goes into the purpose behind that advice, which is to create hope and to glorify God. So let's take a look at the very beginning of that, because I think oftentimes this is where um, we can often get hung up and... Uh, uh, and and lose the purpose to which we have ultimately been called. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to edify him. All right. Now, what is that? What is that saying? Does that mean that we just acquiesce and we just go ahead and say, uh, yeah, do whatever you want to do? I mean, it's God loves you, so it's all cool and it's all good. And the answer to that, of course, is no. We are called to something higher than that. Now, how do we deal with that? Well, I think one thing is we, we are often quick to condemn, and we are less often um, as quick to, uh, to build up. And, and so how, how, can you, uh, how can you call someone to Christ without setting the example of Christ in your own life Furthermore, if you are at enmity, um, then how do you speak at all? Now, we live in a world where, I mean, there is some offbeat stuff going on. Stuff that is clearly decried in Scripture. It is spoken against in the, in the hardest terms. And, and that covers a lot of territory. I'm not talking about one sin at all. I'm talking about sin in general. And, and so um, if we're not displaying the love of Christ, we are going to be very hard pressed to offer words of encouragement and uh, more importantly, words of correction. So basically, I think one of the things that Paul is saying here is um, you know where you stand. And as you grow, you grow progressively stronger if you're growing in Christ. There are other people who aren't there, aren't there remotely or aren't quite there. And, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, so I'm the big brother, so I know everything and, you know, you don't know anything and, and uh, you poor little thing tap him on the head. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is that understanding comes really through the Holy Spirit. And your words uh, have an impact in presenting the nature of God uh, and opening the door for the Holy Spirit to be working in and through you. So we don't work to please ourselves. We don't work to come out right. We don't have to look right all the time. We don't have to have other people acknowledge that we're correct and they're wrong. And, and I see people um, often doing that. Right now, it's rampant. Um, again, if you're on Facebook, which you apparently are because you're listening to me right now or later on YouTube, um, you know, you see this kind of stuff all the time from both sides and from every direction. Um, are, you, are you presenting the, the vindictive or are you presenting the love of God? Are you holding up truth in love or are you simply saying, if you don't believe me, if you don't agree with me, you're an idiot. Um, and, and honestly, I don't see an awful lot of this. I see an awful lot of this. And as Christians, it is imperative for us, as Jesus did, to be working for the good of those around us. Not for their sake, but for our call's sake in terms of serving God. 
Um, it is. It doesn't mean we diminish the truth in any way, shape, or form. But what it does mean is we try to live out the truth in a way that is going to be appealing rather than condemning. And it is so easy to turn to just simply say, well, you're going to hell. And that That's... That's not that's not going to get anybody much into heaven. It used to. You know, you create these images of hell, and people were terrified. And uh, But, you know, that's not where we need to be at in this day and age. And, uh, you know, Jesus died for every single one of us, and we need to be working toward that end. Now, I'm going to tell you again, as I've said many times, not everybody's going to say yes to that. And that's a heartbreak for anyone who loves Christ. Because it breaks Christ's heart. But that's the truth. But in the meantime, how do we approach it? Well, we approach it um, with uh, a lack of desire to please ourselves. Why? Because we're simply servants of God. You don't have to please yourself. You don't have to come out of every uh, conversation feeling like you won. If you do, um, probably you're more fooling yourself than anybody else. But if you come out of every conversation feeling like you have done what God is calling you to do and feeling like you have shared something of the love of God, then you're starting in a whole other and a whole lot better place. And and we're you know, we're told Christ didn't please himself. That wasn't that wasn't the goal that Jesus had when he came to please himself. He glorified himself, ultimately, in what he did. But that wasn't a matter of, uh, of saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look good in the end at all. Remember what Jesus said in the garden, Lord, if there's any way you can take this, Father, from me, please do so. But nevertheless, I will do what you call me to do. Um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think Jesus was really looking ahead to the glorification. I think he was looking ahead to what it was that he was about to embark on, a journey that would end in his death on the cross, the worst possible death one human being has come up with to put another human being to. Um, just a, you know, an amazing thing. And, and so he also then received the reviling of the people and uh, because he, he understood that it, that wasn't about him. That was the people's rejection of God. The reproaches of those who reproached thee, that is God, fell on me. By the same token in our lives, the reproaches that people pour on us, I, you know, um, was eating breakfast, going through Facebook, and honestly, uh, I, saw, I saw, you know, post after post that really was an attack on God's work uh, rather than simply an attack on an individual or the church because we are supposed to be representing Christ, not ourselves. And, uh, and, and that's one of the biggest breaks. If you really want to serve people in the world, you're going to have to give yourself up and recognize that the hardships that are coming your way are hardships that are really aimed at God. And uh, and so you need to stand strong in Christ and receive that. I recall uh, one time, and uh, and if I've told you this story before, I you know I'm terrible about that. I'm a, I'm a getting older and a and I'm a bit of a storyteller, so um, I tell the same old stories. Uh, I got a call one day from. The hospital from a uh, father of uh, a girl who had uh, she and her husband had just lost their as I recall he was two and a half uh, year old baby and uh, in a uh, uh, a crib situation it was not crib death but um, I I'm gonna leave it right there uh, and uh, wondered if I could meet them down at the hospital, you know, and the whole family was there. And I walked in, and when the father saw me, and I don't know that we'd ever met before, but he knew I was coming, and I think he was kind of 
at some levels, um, not lying in wait. I don't, I don't think you, you possibly could at that level, having just lost a child. But when he saw me, something inside him snapped. And he, he raced over to me. He grabbed the front of my shirt, and he got right in my face. And he said, you tell me how a God who's supposed to love people could possibly make this happen. And, um, you know, I really was, I really thought he was going to start swinging. And, uh, and my, my, uh, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you here. Okay. My immediate response was, and what have you ever done for God that would make you think that you would get special privileges? That was Jamie. That was not Jesus. That was totally Jamie. And, and I can sit there and say, well, I was defending God. No, I wasn't. You know, I was trying to be right. Now, if I had said that, God forgive me for even thinking it. Um, but fortunately, <laughs> God, God two by four me. And uh, right in the back of the head. And he smacked me good. And uh, and all of a sudden, I realized that if this guy started swinging, I would simply stand there and take it. And so the, the verbal violence that was implied, if it had turned to physical violence, that I, I would have stood there and taken. And it's not because I'm tough. I'm not tough. But I knew that God would strengthen me to stand there and take it. It was just sort of like, okay, God, whatever. I'm yours. I'm, I'm sorry. And, uh, and the words that did come out of my mouth were, you know, I, I, I'm not going to try to make any excuses for God. He doesn't need me to do that. I know if I was God, I, I wouldn't have let this happen if I had that power and somehow I would have been wrong. I said, I trust God and I hope that you will be able to trust God even in this. And the one thing I can tell you is I believe 100% your child is now with the Lord. And uh, it's up to you whether or not you ever want to see him again. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, encouraged him when, when he was able to, to give me a call to sit down and talk. Well, I did the funeral service, and, um, and he came up to me and apologized. And, uh, and I was able to say to him, look, I have no idea what I would have done if I had been in your place. I said, I can't tell you I wouldn't have been so angry I'd have started swinging. I said, I, I cannot tell you that. I have no idea because thankfully I have not been through that. And I hope I never have any reason to fully understand what you went through because it is the most unimaginable horror I can, uh, I can think of. And I said, but uh, please know that God holds none of your anger against you either. And let me say again, God loved your child more even than you did. And how I and how he let this happen, I do not know. But I do know that his love for your child is profound. And his love for you is just as great. And, uh, and I mean, it was something to that effect. I'm not, you know. And I meant it. I meant it. And it, it, it was an amazing time. It really was. And, uh, and very heartbreaking. And I saw, I saw myself at my worst. And, uh, and, and I saw God um, at his best. And sometimes his best doesn't make everything wonderful and happy you know it doesn't because we live in such a broken broken world but um you know when when i could get off 
Jamie the, the minister and become Jamie the servant of Christ. That's when things changed. And, uh, and, and that's what he's talking about here. Uh, we please our neighbors for their good, the good of God. We please our neighbors for the good of God in order to teach them about the goodness of God. We please our neighbors for their, their good in order to teach them about the good of God so that they might have hope. You and I, unless you're, you know, Jewish, we would have had no heritage and no hope because God was distant from us. But in Christ, God chose to reach out to all, any who would receive. And, and so it is our job to present Christ in that way in the world today, constantly and everywhere. And, uh, and that means that we need to give ourselves. And we give ourselves to God so that God can give us to others. And uh, it, right now, for many people who, who really get this, and this has been a big chunk of their life, reaching out to others, this is a very painful time because you do not have the same opportunities. But um, the one thing I'm sure of is that there is hope. That's what the passage is talking about, ultimately. The goal, what's the goal for us as human beings, is hope. For God, it's that he might be glorified. And, uh, and, and that's where it's at. Um, in, this, uh, in this book, A Prayer, A Guide to Prayer for Ministers and Other Servants, uh, every day, uh, as I've said before, there's an invocation, a psalm reading, a scripture reading, uh, then there are other readings for reflection. We've done those. Then there's uh, it encourages you to move to a time of prayer and a time of reflection, which is really kind of what our devotions are, is, is my reflection on the things that I've read and what they mean to me. And I'm just kind of including you in that, and I, um, I hope that's okay. Then there's always uh, there's one hymn for the week as well, and this is this is one of my favorites, and I... I, uh, I thought today um, that, I, I haven't done this before, but I thought I'd do the hymn. Uh, it's when the storms of life are raging. And so I thought that would be a good place to finish, because boy, aren't the storms of life raging right now. And uh, the, uh, you, don't, you may not know this, this hymn, but uh, there's a, an, in, an introduction line, and then, then you can sing along with me, Stand By Me. Then there's a, that thing repeats, and then there's stand by me, and then there's some stuff, and then it ends with stand by me. And it'll, you'll pick it up right after the first verse, I'm sure. <clears throat> Let me take a cup of coffee here, a quick slip. That's a combination of a slurp and a sip. <clears throat> I'm going to get something over that to hold it down so I can see it. <laughs> Piles are wonderful things, aren't they? <laughs> when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea. Thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the hosts of sin assail, and my strength begins to fail, Thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I've done the best I can, 
and my friends misunderstand. Thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden, and I'm nearing chilly Jordan, O thou lily of the valley, stand by me. I think that if we all could stop for a moment and recognize the fact that Jesus does stand by us, the indwelling presence of God is with us, and God looks over us, and if we thought about that, wouldn't it change the things that we do at a moment's notice on a given day? If we really recognize that truth, and it is truth, it is truth, wouldn't it change who we are? And wouldn't it change our ability to respond to people who don't know that truth? And if you think it would change stuff, folks, that's where we need to be praying. So blessings on you, on your day and on your week. We're uh, on Wednesday. It's hump day. Time goes on quicker and quicker, just as an amazing thing. So blessings upon you. Amen. <laughs>